So, look, my name is James. Um, I work out of St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, and like a lot of you, I'm also in, in lockdown um, at the moment. Um, and, look, I'm a psychologist by trade, and I've been working in tobacco cessation really for the past 20 years um, as a clinician, as a researcher, um, and as a trainer as well. And, and really what I want to do today um, is share with you some of my experiences around the use of the carbon monoxide monitor, uh, which I know that, that all of you have, um, well, whether you have received it yet or not, I'm not too sure, but I think you will fairly soon. Yes. Um, and really some of the practical uh, tips and tricks in using this. Um, and I know I've had a lot of questions over the years um, with regards to this, and I just want to share with you some of uh, my knowledge around that. I'm the current New South Wales statewide smoking cessation training coordinator. Um, and so I have met a lot of you um, in my travels around the state and good to see you again um, as well. Feel free to put any questions in the chat box. If you can't find the chat box, don't worry about it. You can always email me. A few people e emailed me yesterday and, and that's fine. So, but I am mindful of the time. So let's just get straight into this, shall we? Um, so at the completion, we are going to know, hopefully, um, or at least understand the clinical features of um, the CO breath monitor, understand why it can be a useful tool, identify limitations of the device, know how to use the device and interpret the results and have tips for providing uh, engaging feedback, really, with our clients, because that's a really important component um, of this. Um, so what is a CO breath monitor? What is it? So well, this is it here. Um, it's a device that measures exhaled carbon monoxide in breath, which correlates quite well um, with the amount of carboxyhemoglobin in the bloodstream. Uh, and, and the work's been done on that already. It was done quite a while ago. Um, you're getting a particular model called the Pico Baby Monitor, which measures, measures the mother's carbon monoxide level in her breath uh, in a number of different ways. So the most common way and the way that we use is in parts per million. It's easy to understand. And also as a percentage of carboxyhemoglobin. And it also gives you another reading, uh, a percentage fe a fetal reading of carboxyhemoglobin as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along uh, today. One particular study where um, carbon monoxide was monitored uh, at birth, uh, you can see there if you're getting a reading in parts per million between zero and five, um, you know, the average uh, weight was 3,448 3, grams. But when you start to get excess carbon monoxide above that, um, or what we might call the carbon monoxide boost, um, you see a, a steady uh, and significant reduction in birth weight. And certainly, uh, if you're scoring um, above 20 parts per million, you know, on average, there's quite a significant reduction um, in birth weight. So, uh, and that's very concerning, obviously. Uh, and, um, and, and what we're really trying to do uh, is minimise the risks around birth weight um, and, of course, um, reduce stillbirth as part of the Safer Baby Bundle. Uh, initiative. So really why this is a useful tool is that it provides, you know, a visible objective piece of data that something may not quite be right, you know, very much akin to say high blood, blood pressure readings, something like that, uh, and provides unbiased biofeedback. There's something about smoking. I mean, I've been working in smoking for a long time. Everyone's got an opinion on smoking. Um, everyone knows how to quit, apparently. Um, and, you know, uh, and everyone is sometimes people are a little bit, un, you know, not not quite um, convinced by what the clinician might be saying. And that's quite OK. But so this this piece of data can uh, provide some objective, unbiased um, information for the for the end user. One thing I, I think you'll find is very helpful for this monitor, for you using this monitor, is that it may motivate mum to commence or maintain efforts to quit. And certainly from clinical experience and, and, and research, um, you know, we've been able to see that, that smokers find this biofeedback very acceptable, very acceptable um, and quite motivating. And it has also been tested on pregnant women um, where they also have found this device to be very motivating and, and uh, uh, and acceptable to, to use. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along because I know that has been some 
there has been some concern uh, raised by um, midwives around that, um, but I really don't think you've got too much to worry about. Um, so what are some of the limitations? There are some limitations with this device. It's certainly not a quit smoking miracle cure. It's certainly not that. They aren't essential devices really, um, but they are useful devices. What it can do is just add to the plan, add to a cessation plan, which is the motiv uh, motivational component. So it can certainly help, but as a miracle cure in and of itself, that's not going to be the case. Um, perhaps one of the um, shortfalls of this is it can only measure smoking in the prior 24 hours due to carbon monoxide having a very short half-life of roughly four and a half hours. So if, you know, if someone, um, you know, has smoked, say, three or four days before and not, not since, it's just not going to show up in a reading. They may be regular daily smokers, but you may not be able to detect it under those kinds of circumstances. Most smokers are regular daily smokers. That That's true. But there will be cases where they may have been smoking over the previous week and you're not going to be able to detect it through this monitor. False positives can occur. And when I mean by what I mean by false positives, it doesn't mean you're getting an inaccurate reading. It's just that it can be explained by other uh, reasons than the uh, than the client smoking. Um, uh, and I'll talk about those in a second as well. Uh, and there's also the challenge around marginal re readings. What do we do with those people who are sort of five, six, seven parts per million, just above the no smoking range? Um, you know, and that can be fairly tricky as well. Um, are they smoking? Are they not smoking? We just have, sometimes have to think a little bit outside of the square about what could be explaining those kinds of readings. Well, these are the kinds of things that could explain that passive smoking. So if you have other people around you that are smoking, if someone's sitting right next to you and smoking, then that is going to boost carbon monoxide levels, um, certainly by one part per million, but certainly a few more parts per million as well uh, for some people, maybe five or six parts per million. It's very, very hard to say exactly. Uh, I think there was a piece of work done uh, not that long ago that showed just by living in a city, um, you would have one part per million above everyone else. Um, there's going to be other sources of um, carbon monoxide as well uh, that we do have to um, think about. A lot of your clients will be smoking cannabis. They don't even see themselves as tobacco smokers, and that's going to give a nice big reading in, in carbon monoxide uh, as well. And some people, you know, may still use tobacco. They, they what we call spin it with, with cannabis, but they don't see themselves as, as smokers. So we just do need, do need to take into account some of those circumstances too. The device could be faulty. That's always possible. Uh, you know, and over time, uh, things can go wrong with the device. Um, perhaps it may need recalibrating. I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but by and large, that is not going to be the case for the vast majority of occasions. Um, and there's also the possibility of someone having very high levels of hydrogen on their breath. That's very unusual. I don't think I've ever come across this, a case like this. But, uh, you know, the research says this is the, you know, this is something that, that could happen. Um, that's generated in the human digestive system, uh, mainly with people who are lactose intolerant. So, uh, you know, so if you are getting high readings, you don't know um, what else could be explaining it, then perhaps that's something to, to take into account. I think that is going to be very rare uh, and I, I, you know, I think you're not going to come across that very often. So let's get down to the nitty gritty, um, cut to the chase, shall we? Um, how do you use the test? Well, the first thing is to offer the test, you know, and certainly if it's the first time someone's used this um, or being offered this, then we do have to um, explain what the test is. And, and, and you know, I, and I, I did say this yesterday, there really is no perfect pitch with this. I've got my own pitch. I'll show you the pitch that I use. Um, you know, I suppose I vary the pitch um, every now and again. And I think it's important that you develop your own pitch as well, the one that you're comfortable with. Um, so... You know, I always try and keep it very informal, um, all the language very relaxed, um, you know, very much in layman's terms. Uh, and so the kind of things that I might say would be, look, you know, this device measures the amount of carbon monoxide flowing through your body. Too much uh, carbon monoxide can be harmful to our cells and our baby. Look, it's a pretty easy test. It works the same way as an old style breathalyzer where you just blow into a tube. Look, just to let you know, smokers do tend to have readings higher than what we would want for our best health for mum and baby. 
most most non-smokers are within the safe range. Look, it's entirely up to you, um, but would you like to see how much carbon monoxide you have in your body? It'll also convert the reading into the amount you have your baby has as well. What do you reckon? So that's the that's the kind of pitch that I would use. Very relaxed, very informal, uh, and I think if you just pitch it that way, your uptake uh, will be quite quite high, very high actually. I think so. Um, so the the unit itself. Let's have a look at this. So the unit itself. You've got the that. There's the unit. You've probably all seen this, I would think, or most of you would have. Um, there's a section that goes into it, the D piece, clicks right into it there. Very straightforward. I haven't got it turned on yet, don't worry. Uh, and there's also a disposable mouthpiece that slots straight in to the D piece. Very straightforward. Um, so, so in terms of the steps, um, well, if I include Include that as the first step. Step two would be uh, attach the D piece to the unit, which I've just done, and then ask the client, ask the client to put the disposable mouthpiece into the unit, uh, and that way you're not touching the disposable mouthpiece at all. Uh, that's very, very important to do. Um, and then turn the device on. I'll turn it on in a second. Uh, and if it's not already on, and then what we do want to do is just explain what the range of scores mean, assuming that they have agreed to this test. So, um, so you know, Lynn, once you've blown into this, you, you, you're going to get a score. A number below five is where we want to be for optimum health. And just to let you know, smokers do generally blow more than four, and that does uh, raise some health risk. At this point, you could also mention that it's measured in parts per million. I think that's essential. Some people um, may be interested in that, um, which is really the number of um, parts of carbon monoxide in a million parts of blood. So, and I, and and look, while I'm at this this point, um, we always use parts per million. It's easy to understand. It's a simple number. Uh, you know, people know if they're in the in the range they need to be or the range they uh, you know that they would that's outside of that, um, that might add health risk. Uh, whereas when we start talking about percentage of carboxyhemoglobin, it can get all very messy and we might understand it, but that may not um, help our uh, help our women. So, so I think uh, for ease of purpose, using the language of parts per million, just as a straightforward number, is, is quite easy to, to understand. Um, so um, here's how it works. So See the girl here, so you, you'll turn it on. Um, I'll turn it on now. Let's see, coming up there now. Oh, hopefully you can see that. So much easier to do this face to face, I can tell you. Oh, there she is, there we go. So um, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so see the girl here, and this is in the role play over here. You know, Lynn, once I press her, once I press her, you need to breathe in and hold your breath and you'll see it, and then you'll see a clock counting down 15 seconds. Now, at the end of the 15 seconds, you will hear two beeps and then one long beep. Now, when the long beep starts, I want you to breathe out with your mouth fully over the tube until you have run out of breath. I always use, use the language mouth fully over the tube because I think sometimes people just put their lips to it like this. And, you know, I don't think that's really what we do. Most people, when they, they hear mouth over the tube, they do put their lips entirely over the tube, which is what we want. So, um, and there you go. So, uh, so that, so do the explanation first of all, and I think that's quite important. Um, so, then we go ahead and complete the test. So, in the role play again. Okay, Lynn, are you ready? Uh, so, I press the button. There she is. I'm going to press her. I've just pressed her. Ah, we've got the countdown going. Oh, you can hopefully you can see the clock there. Is 10, 11. So at this point, I've breathed in, holding my breath. So I breathed out in a slow, steady pattern uh, and I have no breath left. So 
Um, and you can see there my result is two parts per million. I'm a non-smoker. One less than yesterday. That's pretty good. So, um, so that's uh, that's how you do the test. Now, that's kind of easy. That's the easy part. You know, just doing the test like that. Um, this is where it can get. This is where it does where your clinical experience and your uh, clinical know-how um, uh, is important. So what do we do with the results? So the most important thing is just to look at the results together. Uh, and you can see there in this particular uh, test, uh, what's well, exactly the same test uh, result that I just got, um, carbon monoxide is shown in parts per million. That's the number that we want to use. It's just a nice big number on the screen. Look, you do get the equivalent carboxyhemoglobin both for mum and, uh, and and the baby. Uh, and essentially, what you'll find is if, if you are a smoker, uh, the percentage of um, fetal carboxyhemoglobin ramps up significantly after you get past six parts per million, and it's much, much higher uh, than what the um, adult's reading would be, the mother's reading. So, the, you know, so that's very, very important to note that uh, fetal carboxyhemoglobin is going to be a lot higher compared to mums, uh, you know, when when you are above six parts per million, as you'd expect. So there is a coloured uh, traffic light system, which makes for easy understanding. You can't see it on that slide there, but on the left-hand side, it'll be green. And as the readings go up, it gets redder and redder and redder. So the green is where we want to be. Outside of that, it turns into amber, which is a marginal reading, and then it gets into the red zone, which is a smoker zone, or could be explained by other, other reasons. At this step, we also want to just remove the mouthpiece. Well, not us, but our clients. So they remove it, and then they just put it in, discard it in the bin. So we're not touching it. Uh, so let's just look at the readings there. So... Uh, most of your uh, women are going to have a reading in between one and four parts per million. The vast, vast, vast majority of them. Why? Because the vast majority of your women are going to be non-smokers. It's as simple as that. Uh, so bear in mind that, uh, you know, it, it is going to be not unusual um, that people will be outside of that range, but, but you would expect most people who say they're a non-smoker to be within that range. Uh, that's important. Uh, you know, why do we use in, in you know, in, in maternity three parts per million as, as a cutoff point? Well, essentially it comes down to three pieces of research that shows that the sensitivity and specificity um, is best at three parts per million. That's where the crossover uh, is best. Yes, it's not a perfect cutoff point. Um, but by and large, it seems to be that the vast majority of people who don't smoke will be within that range. There may be some outliers, but by and large, the vast, vast, vast majority will be within that range. Um, so, um, so the next thing we want to do is start a chat about it. And less than four parts per million, great, perfect, exactly where we want to be for optimum health. It's normal for everyone to have a small amount of carbon monoxide, by the way. All is looking good. And that's true because some people worry that they've got one, two or three parts per million uh, uh, in there. And, you know, that's normal. That's normal. It's in the atmosphere. So uh, nothing to worry about there. Greater than four parts per million? Okay. It's somewhat higher than the range we would like. I'm just wondering, what's your thoughts about that reading? There's really no perfect script for this, but the way that I um, pitch it is ask the client what their thoughts are about that reading. What's your thoughts about it? You never know what you're going to get, but here are some of the responses that you might get. Well, first of all, there could be a bit of a silence, uh, quite a long silence, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes nothing needs to be said. The client may take time to process the reading in a way that makes meaningful sense to her. That may not even happen when they're in front of you. That could take days or even weeks. But people do make sense of this, um, and sometimes nothing needs to be said. You know, sometimes people will say, look, you know, I wasn't expecting that, and, you know, it's not great. Um, and that may be accompanied by a look of concern. So a response from us would be something like, look, I understand. Would you like to talk about it? 
Well, what does the reading mean? What does this number mean? Well, anything above four is not ideal. Excess carbon monoxide does increase the risk of stillbirth and for delivering a low birth weight baby. Uh, well, I can't understand it. I don't smoke. I don't know how I got this reading of seven or eight parts per million. Well, you know, let's just take a look. How about this? How, how about we just take a look at what you think might be causing the higher reading? And you've already learned what some of those um, reasons might be. If you're still not sure, you can always repeat the test. You know, if you have a feeling this is not where it should be, you can always repeat the test. So some of the ideas of what to say, you know, you could, you know, again, there's no hard or fast rules with this. It really depends on your own clinical judgment here. So some of the things you could say is, look, you know, um, you have a moderate or high or very high amount of carbon monoxide in your bloodstream, which is going through to the placenta, um, going through the placenta to, to the baby. And, and this reduces the amount of oxygen the baby is getting, and that can be harmful for the baby's growth and development. You know, you might want to say something just like this, you know, how do you feel if I organise to have a chat with someone so you can take a closer look at your smoking? They have some great ideas that could help. Um, you know, so there are some health related messages there, but you may not even want to go down that path. You may not, you may not feel as if this is the right thing to do and just go to a discussion around referral to quit line. Um, irrespective of the, uh, of the road the conversation takes, please do try a referral to quit line. And I think the way to do it is to keep it informal. One great thing about this test is that we know through a number of bits of, of work that carbon monoxide breath testing substantially increases referral uptake. So please do see it as a window of opportunity that once someone sees a high score in front of them, you know, there may be an element of motivation to accept a referral. So run with that. So the kind of pitch that um, I use is very informal, very relaxed. I don't even talk about quit line per se. The way that I would pitch it is, look, how do you feel about me getting someone to have a chat with you about your smoking? Look, I'm no expert in this field and they may have some really good ideas that could help. You know, at the end of the day, it's just a conversation. No one can make you quit if you don't want to. How about it? Now, I think if you pitch it that way, you will get a good response. I think if you just say something like, look, would you like a referral to quit line? I don't think you're going to get um, too many wins that way. So keeping it informal, pitching in a way that, that in a way it's attractive, you know, um, I always think about coffee. You know, I think if, if coffee was, coffee cessation was pitched to me that way, it would be, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take that call, I'll have that conversation. Coffee quit line, no thanks. So you can see there that, you know, that kind of low key approach can often um, be very, very helpful. Um, now, this is something that I did want to talk to you about, uh, and that is the um, uh, the effect of reduced smoking but not quitting on carbon monoxide readings. And this is where you may feel somewhat um, confused about the reading, particularly when your um, when your client says, "Look, I've cut right down, cut right down. Uh, I can't understand it." I can't understand why my readings are so high. And this can pose some problems because the clinician may be suspicious that the client is not being truthful. And maybe the client is surprised or disappointed by the reading, um, considering perhaps they've, they've reduced a lot, but the carbon monoxide reading hasn't reduced by much. Um, so, you know, that can be uh, a concern. And potentially, the client may think that the midwife doesn't believe doesn't believe her, um, even though she really is being truthful. What's going on? Well, a phenomenon called compensatory smoking is going on. So, um, without going into too much detail, here's my fake cigarette. As you generally as generally as you reduce your smoking, what you tend to do is draw back deeper and harder to get the same hit that you're used to, the same nicotine dose that we're used to to saturate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in our brain. So more reduction, more puffing, deeper puffs, which means more, potentially more carbon monoxide. So, um, so small levels of cigarettes per day reduction is probably not going to do too much to carbon monoxide readings. And even reducing right down 
may not reduce carbon monoxide readings more than 50%. There's certainly been some work around this that, that more than a 50% reduction uh, in carbon, oh, sorry, in cigarettes per day only reduce carbon monoxide readings by 25%. Unfortunately, with smoking, it's all about quitting. You know, it's all about quitting, not reduction. So, so you know, and, and certainly explaining this to your um, uh, to your uh, women at you know when they have that test at 28 weeks or at any other point where where they may have where you may have volunteered that test, uh, it just may be important to know that sometimes that readings don't come come down very quickly. It's really not until you get down to very low levels of smoking, and that's just the way it is because of the the drawback behaviour. Um, so it does need to be about quitting. The focus has to be around quitting, not just reduction. Reduction to quitting is good, but reduction just for the sake of reduction is really not where we want to be. Uh, so some other things that might concern um, our midwives, and these are some of the um, uh, concerns that have been raised with me, um, and I can certainly understand that. So, you know, I'm worried about this awkward conversation if a woman claims to be a non-smoker, yet the carbon monoxide result is high. You know, what do I do about that? Well, look, it could be an awkward conversation. It could be an awkward conversation. I've had many of those kind of conversations as well. Um, but at the end of the day, the project is about reduction in risk of stillbirth, um, the Safer Baby Bundle project. Um, and for the work that we do, it's it's for all the reasons why we would want people to, to stop smoking. So these conversations are important. However, the conversations are likely to be quite infrequent quite infrequent. So uh, let's say, for example, you know, assuming higher end smoking prevalence um, in pregnancy of 15% in an LHG, I think Hunter New England had that in, in, in 2019, roughly that as a ballpark figure. Then for every 1,000 uh, women uh, tested, it would identify 38 smokers, extra, extra smokers, assuming the upper limit of 25% under-reporting. So if 25% of people are under-reporting, they're not... Um, being truthful about their smoking, then it would identify approximately 38 um, extra women um, uh, in, in, you know, if, if a thousand women are tested. So um, there also is a concern that women might be resistant to a test. Um, look, I think that's unlikely. That's very unlikely. I rarely come across someone that's resistant to it. It's generally quite the opposite. Most people just run to the test. You know, they're really just curious. People, are, humans are just curious by nature. I don't think you're gonna have that problem. Nevertheless, if someone says they don't want the test, that's fine. They, they don't have to have the test. So, um, but I think you find that most people are very, very curious about what's going on, um, both for themselves um, and, uh, and their child, their unborn child. So in terms of hygiene, uh, now, the monitor itself is moulded with a particular uh, product called SteriTouch, um, which is an, anti um, um, an antimicrobe technology uh, for infection control. Um, and what the manufacturer says that um, that it removes or at least um, traps 99% of um, airborne bacteria. Same thing with the um, the filter in the D piece, uh, that it um, traps viruses um, and moisture from the uh, patient's breath. A little bit more about that in a moment. Um, the D piece contains a one-way valve to prevent air being drawn back, into, uh, back from the monitor as well. Um, in terms of hand sanitizing products, it's really important that if you're using alcohol hand sanitization, that the content is lower than 73.5%. Uh, once your hands are dry, then you can use the monitor um, at that point. Uh, alcohol really messes up the readings of this device, so just bear that in mind as well. Um, in terms of cleaning, well, before every uh, test, what we should be doing is just wiping down with the wipes that you've, that you've received or will receive, um, including the D-piece, including the D-piece. Um, the D-piece itself can't be sterilised. So we want to replace the mouthpiece, the disposable mouthpiece after every use. However, the D-piece after every 30 days. So the D-piece should be replaced after every 30 days or when the filter is visibly soiled. We never want to use alcohol uh, or agents containing organic solvents to clean. So just bear in mind, please just use the uh, the wipes that, that have been provided um, um, for for this purpose. 
Um, so, look, in terms of maintenance, replace the batteries when indicated by, by uh, an empty sim uh, symbol. You will get a, a warning light on the device. Remove batteries when device is not used for prolonged, prolonged periods. That's um, like we do with a lot of devices we have in the house. Um, and as I mentioned, replace a D piece every 30 days um, or if visibly soiled. Um, you'll also get a reminder uh, about that as well um, in, in, on the startup screen. Um, in terms of COVID-19, in terms of COVID-19, well, I mean, the first thing I have to say, and it's, and it's probably the most important thing, obviously, we abide by our LHD infection control uh, policy and procedures. That is a given. Um, but just for your information, the manufacturer says the SteriTouch technology um, has been successfully tested against uh, other envelope viruses such as influenza, avian influenza, SARS, and they suggest or they think that, um, you know, it would be effective against COVID-19. Um, why they think that's the case is that, is that uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's killed those viruses uh, upon contact. Um, also, the D-piece filter has been tested to filter viruses as small as 24 nanometers in diameter, and COVID-19 is uh, approximately 125, so they believe that the uh, filter would screen that out. Well, look, they're making some assumptions there. It certainly hasn't been tested uh, against COVID-19 um, directly. Um, however, they believe that it's um, that, that it would be effective against that. Obviously, we have to abide by what, what our um, policy and procedures uh, are um, at the moment. I can certainly tell you that I'm not using these devices at, at, at the moment. Um, uh, just playing it um, very, very safe um, at the moment. Um, so in terms of... Uh, you know, suspecting the monitor isn't working properly. Well, what do we do there? Well, you can always retest. You can always give it another go and see if the reading is fine. Maybe there was a, some kind of hiccup with the original reading. So test it on yourself. Uh, you know, non-smokers should not be getting smoker readings. That, that's the bottom line. There does come a point where it will probably need recalibrating, and that does require us a carbon monoxide gas cylinder, CO gas cylinder. You know, uh, many hospitals, many places have them. I have one. Um, in, in, in our hospital, um, but it does need to be stored correctly. Um, now, if you can't do that, then it would uh, need to be sent away and um, recalibrated by the, uh, uh, by the manufacturer um, or someone that can actually do this, someone that you know that can do this. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. I think you're going to go through a lot of tests before that has to happen. Uh, the sensor itself, though, does need replacing every five years, uh, and a warning mes message will show um, near the change date as well. So every five years of use. So look, in summary, and this very short period of time that we've had together, carbon monoxide a breath monitor uh, testing can be a useful tool to both identify smokers, but also to motivate, and that's the key point here, motivate smokers to make some changes to their smoking um, behaviour. It's really not a miracle uh, smoking cessation device. Uh, it's not, not really meant to, it was never meant to be that, but it can certainly help smokers make a sense of what's going on in their body and that it can add to motivation to make some changes. Most smokers are curious, quite happy to take the test. I don't think you can have too many concerns around that. Um, uh, if you do, please let me know, but I think you'll find that most pe people are very, very curious Using the device is easy. It's really easy. You, can, you see that I've, I've, I've shown you how to use it. It's very straightforward, but it is important to develop your own pitch. And that just takes practice. Certainly happy to have a conversation with um, anyone that would like to, to um, practice with me around that pitch. There's no set rules for conversations about the score. Uh, it often comes down to your own clinical judgment. Sometimes the silence that occurs afterwards is very, very helpful. Our, our, our clients are just making sense of that, what it really means to them. Sometimes what they thought they were going to get is not what they got. Um, and it can be a really great lead into, re, uh, into a referral to quit line. So uh, I think that's one of the great things about doing um, this monitoring in, in the position that, that you're in. So look, here endeth the, the lesson.